So we move in this chapter on free convection or natural convection. It's a long chapter, but I only have one lecture to cover a lot of material, so I'm not going to hit every valley. I'm just going to hit the mountaintops, okay? So let's jump into it. When you see natural or free convection, there's three things that have to happen. You must have, most commonly, gravity, which is a body force, something that acts on the weight or the density of the substance. So you have to have the density, but also the density has to be a function of temperature such that in a zone or a location where it's hot, the density typically is lower at the same pressure. Hence, less mass, you get a buoyancy effect. Hot air rises, cold air sinks. It really is not that much more complicated. So you need G, though. Don't forget that you absolutely need G, and you'll see G floating around quite a bit in our correlations. And you need the rho as a function of temperature, and you need hot and cold. Ideal gas. Well, air, like the air that you're breathing, is an ideal gas. We need to review that, even though you covered it in thermo 1 and before thermo 1 and covered it in fluids and before fluids. So if somebody said, show me the ideal gas equation, you'd probably say P is equal to rho RT. Well, in thermo, we use the reciprocal of mass density, the specific volume. But in heat transfer, we like to talk about the mass density rho. So this is a good form. Somebody says, uh, th then I can rewrite this as rho is equal to P divided by RT. Do you like that? Does that look good? Sure. Um, what are the things to remember about this temperature and this pressure? They must be absolute. You're beyond kindergarten. Somebody says, you know, the temperature is zero degrees C. You don't put zero in for the temperature in the ideal gas equation. You have to convert to the absolute temperature scale Kelvin in the way you go. All right. There's a property called the volumetric thermal expansion coefficient, or the thermal volumetric expansion coefficient, or some words like that. And uh, beta is very, very common in the textbooks that we use. Uh, both the thermo book as well as the heat transfer book and a lot of other heat transfer books. Beta is the volumetric thermal expansion coefficient. It's defined as negative, and we often, or I may every now and then forget that negative, but it's in there. It's in the definition. 1 over rho, the rate of change of rho with respect to temperature holding pressure constant. So remind me, what is this rho that we see twice in this equation? Mass density. What is this T? Temperature. And what is this P? So you're holding pressure constant. Let's go ahead and calculate this parameter beta, or the volumetric expansion coefficient, for an ideal gas. We just said for an ideal gas that rho is equal to, help me, what's it say in your notes? P divided by RT. Well, just stick that into the calculate derivative of rho with respect to temperature, which means holding pressure constant, derivative with respect to temperature of P divided by RT, holding pressure constant. Can the pressure and the gas constant come outside of the derivative? And so now you're left with the derivative with respect to temperature of, let's put it as T to the minus one. Uh, we already held P constant. I'm gonna pause. Calculus experts that you are, I'm going to walk around and I want to see you take the derivative. So we have the P and the R, those are constants, and it's a negative 1 over T squared, or negative T to the minus 2, a couple ways you could write it. So let's do this. Uh, let me clean this up just a little bit. I'm going to put negative right there. I'm going to put a 1 over t right there, and then a 1 over t like that. True? Does it look good? And then we look and we say p, get rid of this one, p divided by rt. I've seen that before. I've seen that before. What is that? It's rho, isn't it? So this is equal to minus 
rho over t. So now we can go back to the beta, since we worked on this so much. We have minus 1 over rho from this part, times the derivative of rho with respect to t for an ideal gas, which is minus rho over t. I'll tell you what, I'll handle the minus signs. Negative times negative is positive. You handle the rows, and what do we get for beta? Double box it. We're going to use that a lot when you do natural convection. So what you find is the volumetric thermal expansion coefficient for an ideal gas is 1 over the absolute temperature. Now, does that tell me what the volumetric thermal expansion coefficient is for a liquid? Do you know in the rush of things, I'll every now and then, even though I have a liquid, I'm trying to do a natural convection calculation in liquid, I'll say, oh, for a liquid, beta is 1 over T. Am I right? Nope. Beta is only 1 over T for an ideal gas. Only for an ideal gas. Well, what happens if you don't have an ideal gas? Go back. This is a property of the substance, and look for it in a table somewhere. Somebody's made some measurements. All right. So this is the definition of beta. For liquid water, true or false, just we don't have clickers today, so we'll just call it out. Liquid water, can it be treated as an ideal gas? False. false. It's false. No, it cannot. You know, I'll give an exam problem, and it'll be buoyancy in liquid water, and phew, autopilot, beta is 1 over T, let's go. And you can't do that. Uh, air at 300 Kelvin, that's about room temperature, 1 atm, about room pressure, can be treated as an ideal gas. True or false? True. true, very true. Hot air rises, cold air sinks. That's the general principle of buoyancy. If you have to explain buoyancy to or, or, or heat transfer, convection heat transfer like this, natural convection uh, to a, I don't know, sixth grader, third grader, hot air rises, cold air sinks. And then hot water rises and cold water sinks. In general, it's very true, but there's some very limited cases where it's not. So it's 99.99% true, but the 0.01% is life and death for you and me, and we want to just review it. This is going back to uh, elementary school, not even high school. Seriously, I mean, it's, it's back there, but you'll get it. Somebody says, I want you to get the volumetric thermal expansion coefficient for saturated pure water, liquid water, at, let's say, 290 Kelvin. You have to some film temperature, ambient temperature. Well, you would not look for 1 over T. You would need to get that out of a table where other properties are in the table. So in the back of the book, like 290 Kelvin, you start looking, oh, that's a saturation pressure. Here are some specific volumes, some um, heat of vaporization, the specific heats, viscosity of liquids and vapor, thermal conductivity, Prandtl number, liquid vapor, surface tension. Aha. What is that? Expansion coefficient. It's beta. So I look down here and I grab the 174.0. And here's my question for you. The thermal expansion coefficient of liquid water at 290 is 170 inverse Kelvin or 0. 0.000 oh, 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 whatever, 174 inverse Kelvin or 174 times 10 to the plus 6 inverse Kelvin, A, B, or C. There was a question or two, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, during the exam. Last time we had the exam, uh, hey, I've got this table. What happens to this exponent up here? I see this 10 to the 6. Uh, do I take the number and multiply by 10 to the 6, divide by 10 to the 6? Because it's going to make a big difference in my answer. And you know what I said? Sit down and do the best job you can. But it appears that you're not familiar like you should be with the appendices in the tables in this textbook. And this is a common problem in engineering. You've got tables of data. You need to know how to handle it. 
So the correct answer is B, isn't it? If you, I'm not going to review that. I'm going to hold back. But I'm going to challenge you, if you're struggling with, at anything like this, to go and figure it out. This was like beat to death in Thermo 1. All right. Now, another question. The thermal expansion coefficient, hey, that's our symbol beta, is always greater than or equal to zero. True or false? False? False. Look at right up here. What's that say? Some betas are negative. This is where maybe cold water doesn't sink but actually rises, and warm water actually falls or sinks. Yeah. So you go back and you take a look at water. It's a very ubiquitous fluid. It's all over. Some of you sleep in it, not sleep in it, wash in it. Some of you swim in it. Some of you drink it. It's all over. You're very familiar with water. So anyway, here is uh, for water at 0, 4, 10, blah, blah, blah. Here are the volumetric expansion coefficients, thermal expansion coefficients digitally, as well as plotted out. Notice that there is a peak in the density for water. Where is the maximum liquid density for water? At what temperature? Four degrees C. That's a nice number to remember. Sometimes you'll see that. Like, why do they quote this at four degrees C for water? Well, that's the maximum density. Meaning that as I decrease the temperature, I'm cooling it, it's getting more and more dense. But then something special happens at four. It hits its maximum density. As you continue to cool it, what does it do? Does it get more dense? Less dense. It's actually starting to expand. And then when you get to zero degrees C and it goes through the solidification, do you think it jumps way down or jumps way up? It jumps way down. It really expands. It becomes much less dense or lower density than the liquid. So if you put ice cubes in your cup of water, do they sink to the bottom of the cup or float to the top? Do icebergs and all this other, many applications, right, in life associated with this. So this is right here. So what is beta? Beta is related to the negative of the slope of this line. So the slopes all here are positive, meaning it has a negative beta, negative thermal expansion coefficient. Here, they're all positive beta. All right. I already covered this, didn't I? Notice that they also have, no, I didn't, I have to ask that question. Notice that they also have for ethylene glycol and oil and other liquids, you can go and find. But uh, the beta for a lot of liquids is much, much smaller than for gases. Gases are more sensitive to temperature affecting its density. All right, all right. Here's a question, I hope I can read it here. The thermal expansion coefficient for saturated water at 10 degrees C is, is right up here. I, I grabbed it right out of this table, right? Um, it's right here. Do you see that? 0. 0.000088. But look at the units. It's 1 over degrees C. Somebody says, I don't need it in 1 over degrees C. I need it in 1 over Kelvin. What is beta for water at one, in, in units of 1 over Kelvin? A, B, or C? Do I divide by 273, multiply by 273, or just, oh, ignore it? And why? Because it really is the, the beta... Uh, goes back to the rate of change, very good, of density with respect to temperature. It's like a density change to a temperature change. It's a temperature change that's important, not the magnitude of the temperature in the definition of beta. All right, so A is the correct answer. Somebody says, that works so good. Next time I have a problem where it's like, oh, the velocity is 15 miles per hour and I need it in meters per second, I'm just going to say 15 and, you know, forget the units. 
don't do it. This is just one of those special cases where you can be really, really ignorant and still get the right answer. All right, so there you go. All right, this really explains why lakes freeze from the top down. What would be the impact on the poor fishies in the world if you had your lake water and it froze from the bottom up? By the middle of the winter, or the, they would be like out of liquid water and they'd be toast. So what happens is if the lake freezes from the top down and it gets so thick in some states up north you can drive vehicles and do all sorts of fun stuff on lakes because you can drive your car out there right who's ever driven a vehicle out one two yeah my cousins took me ice fishing once it is a very weird feeling <laughs> like i was here in august we put in a boat here now we're just gonna yep just drive right on out oh they like to see you when you do that colorado you drive on ice no it is crazy. Minnesota? Oh, man. Anyway, uh, you get over it. Uh, but anyway, uh, this down here, the fish are happy, and that actually uh, insulates the lake water. And it'll grow a couple feet thick, but it won't typically go and penetrate the whole depth. So anyway, let's press forward. For an ideal gas, the thermal expansion coefficient is always positive. True or false? For an ideal gas, it is 1 over T, always, for an ideal gas. And this is restricted to an ideal gas. So when could that be equal to zero? Temperature of the sun, you know, 6,000 Kelvin. Ah, well, how about can we go like zero Kelvin, so cold? Nah, stuff is going to start to liquefy. Forget the ideal gas. How about negative 10 Kelvin? You're not going to fall into that trap. No, 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 no. For an ideal gas, a thermal expansion coefficient is always positive. For a solid, the thermal expansion coefficient is undefined for a solid. True or false? We have this beta. It's defined as negative 1 over rho, the rate of change of rho with respect to temperature holding pressure constant. False. It's false. You can, you can, we may not need it in this class for free or natural convection. There isn't free or natural convection in a solid. But if you're a civil engineer and you're thinking about cold and hot days for your bridge and it may thermally expand and contract, you need to consider that. I mean, this is the same property? But yeah. Yeah, because atmospheric pressure isn't changing, and hopefully you don't have the abutment so tight that when it tries to thermally expand, it, it gets constrained and now starts to push concrete on concrete and buckle or other terrible things. There's gaps they put in the bridges, right? So anyway, all substances, the thermal expansion coefficient is greater than or equal to zero for all substances. True or false? False. We just saw where it was negative. Yeah. Now we got to get into hot uh, or natural convection. We'll, we'll start off with a hot knife edged vertical plate in a cool quiescent fluid. What does quiescent fluid mean? What's the word quiescent? It basically wants to be still. It's pretty still. It's not like blowing. There's no forced convection. Now we're doing natural free convection. And you have a cool fluid in a hot plate, presence of gravity, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have some motion. Why is there now motion? Because of natural convection, buoyancy-driven flow. The plate is a vertical. Um, should I draw the plate like this or draw the plate like that? The second one. Now it's hot. It's knife-edged, so it's very, very thin. And you could even put a little tip on it like this. And you now have basically a cool fluid. Is the bulk motion of the fluid just focusing on one side of it? Is it going to be kind of like this direction or this direction? The first one, yeah. Hot air rises, cold air sinks. So why is the air over here going to be warm compared to the air over here? Well, it's closer to the hot plate, conduction. 
and as soon as there's conduction off of the hot plate, then it's going to want to be buoyed upward. All right. So the book introduces a coordinate system to solve this problem. Do you think they would put a coordinate system X and Y? No, that would be too easy. We're going to put Y and X. Now I can explain why they chose that coordinate system because they want to talk about the velocity and they want to talk about the velocity and they'll pick this location X and they'll just come out with that coordinate system Y, right? And they're going to say, I'm going to talk about the U component of velocity. Well, we go cap V is equal to U I plus V J plus W K. If they say I'm talking about the U component, it's in the X direction, right? All right. So the if I come close to the plate but not right adjacent to the plate, I say at this location right here, get rid of this. This is, um, this is my little X coming up. My U component of a velocity, you think it would look like this or like that? Up or down? Up. It would look up. True. If I come way, way out here, quiescent fluid, you think it's like this or like this? Trick question. It's not either option A or option B. It's option C. Neither. It's zero. Stationary, true, far, far away. Oh, there's a little downward drift, but not much. The flow is like zero, 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 and then you come up, and it's going to have a maximum close to the hot surface, or do you think the maximum will be on the hot surface? Where do you think the maximum will be, the maximum speed? Right adjacent to the hot surface? No slip. That's a hint. No slip. So guess what the speed of the flow is right there at the hot surface? Zero. So this is a crazy velocity profile. It goes like this. Yeah, it takes a while to think about it, but there it is. That's a velocity profile. Make sense? It's actually pretty steep right in here. Go like that. All right. Now, what about the temperature profile? We'll come up here. We'll pick a different height and just sketch the temperature profile. Way out here, the temperature is T infinity. All right. At the surface, it's a maximum TS. What do you think the temperature profile looks like? Something complicated or pretty simple? Just like an exponential. Pretty simple. So with knowledge of the temperature profile, oh, it's going to look like this, and the velocity profile, it's going to look like this. We can come up with our basic equations which govern natural convection. Three of them. Well, more than that, but you have the continuity, conservation of mass. You have the momentum in x, y, two-dimensional, or if you're on three, x, y, and z, momentum equation. And you have the energy equation. Well, Professor, I thought you were going to hit the mountaintops only in this chapter. You're exactly right. So let's just hit the mountaintops and leave the details in the valley alone because this is not going to be easy. So you look at the X momentum equation. You also look at the Y momentum equation. The Y momentum equation is trivial. It says that there is really no pressure change as you move at a constant X in any Y. So, but you have gravity out here, so the dp dx is uh, the change of the pressure far away into the fluid with respect to x, which is minus rho infinity g. It's just hydrostatics. So we can replace this term in our y momentum equation with a little thought process when we analyze the uh, when we analyze the y momentum, we can go back and replace in the x momentum in this term. Then combine these two terms, and it looks like that. Divide everybody in that equation by rho. And then you take a look at this term right here, and you work on it a little bit. You say, you know what? Beta is defined as this, and it's approximated as the density change over the temperature change. Hey, what happened to that minus sign? Well, I switched the order between this one and that one. And then you can replace here, so you get a buoyancy term. You get an advection term, and you get a, a diffusion of momentum term due to the viscosity. This is what drives 
the fluid flow. Notice that without any G, that term will go away. Without, with a very, very low beta coefficient, that term is smaller and smaller and smaller. And if there's no delta T, no natural convection. So it's a product of those three terms. We started the discussion with the discussion of those three terms. Okay. So you have your continuity, your momentum. After a little work, the x and y momentum collapsed to just the x momentum. You have your energy equation. We now want to set up and solve in that boundary layer region. What boundary layer region? You could think about the thermal boundary layer, the penetration of the thermal information into the flowing fluid, as well as the velocity boundary layer. And aren't you glad other people have worked in this field before us? So we can cast these all in dimensionless form. That's just like what we did in chapter 6. Yeah. And we find we get parameter like the Reynolds number, Prandtl number. But then we have to pick what is our speed. We used to have a U-infinity approach. We don't have that. This is natural convection. But the speed squared is uh, proportional to G beta delta T L. It's at G beta delta T and then some height L, some length scale. So if you use that, you can make that Reynolds number look like this parameter and that parameter, Professor Grashoff, so they honor his name, they, that's the Grashoff number. And you think, what was the Reynolds number? It was a ratio of two competing terms, Reynolds number for forced convection. It was ratio of inertial to viscous. Well, the Grashoff, look at the numerator. It's the ratio of buoyancy to viscous forces. So when you have a large G, well, that's usually constant for Earth. You have a large beta, a large delta T, large L cubed. Then you have a lot of buoyancy and have the new with the viscosity. So the Grashoff number is equal to this. It's a ratio of buoyancy and viscous. They look down here and they say, well, Reynolds times Prandtl really shows up. So why don't we do that? And sure, the Grashoff times the Prandtl. Professor Rayleigh did a lot of work in this. It's the Rayleigh number. We're getting too many numbers. We're going to have to calm down now, right? There's too many of these dimensionless parameters and numbers to keep track of. But you'll see a lot of correlations with the Rayleigh number in there. Well, somebody else really did a lot of work. This is like the Blasius solution of the boundary layer and force flow over a flat plate. Stream function, so that continuity is satisfied. You have a similarity variable. Somebody else thought this one up before me. They were very clever. I'm sure there were a lot of dead ends in the trials before they settled on what is a good similarity variable. You then have a way of having u. You get a combined equation here. That combined equation is for the momentum equation. Look at the third derivative in this function, f. You have an energy equation. They're coupled. See that? They're coupled. So they can't be easily coupled where you solve for velocity and then feed that into the energy. Nope, not that easy. It's harder, a lot harder than the Blasius. Anyway, other people have solved for it. Let's just say that that's been done. Press forward. What happens if you have the Rayleigh number and it's defined maybe in this distance x going away from that leading edge? So it would be g beta delta t x cubed divided by nu alpha. So as, the Rayleigh, as you get further up away from the leading edge, x is increasing, and you finally get to a point where it can be turbulent. It's just like force flow over a flat plate. Remember the critical Reynolds number for force flow over flat plate? Half a million. Well, experimentally determined now, if you look at a Rayleigh number defined like this, you'll have laminar flow at the beginning, and then you get up to around a Rayleigh number of 10 to the 9, and that's our transition or critical Rayleigh number. So when the Rayleigh number is greater, it's turbulent. So a lot of times you'll see correlations where they say, um, oh, and the Rayleigh number less than this number, 10 to the 9, something like that. Use this correlation. But when it's greater than 10 to the 9, you know, the Rayleigh number greater than, 
Rayleigh number less than, uh, use a different correlation because it's moving into a different regime for the flow. Let's take a look here. Here's our vertical plate. And they have it flowing like this, and they have it flowing like this. In one of these cases, either case A or case B, the plate is hot. And in the other case, the plate is cold. Can you tell which one is the case hot? A, right? And in case B, well, the plate where it's cold and the fluid's close to it sinking. And here is a nice long correlation. I don't recall any limits on the Rayleigh number on this one. I could look... They say, look at if it's inclined, modify your G and use this equation. Um, if you have a um, hot surface up or cold surface down, use these different equations. And you start to see some of them, you'll see patterns. You'll see this Rayleigh to a quarter. That's a, a sign for it being laminar. And then a Rayleigh to a third, that's a sign that the correlation is turbulent. Notice the higher range of the Rayleigh number. All right, let's go on. Here is a cylinder, nice long correlation, note, good for this range of Rayleigh number. And for a sphere, there's a lot of correlations. Why are there a lot? Why don't, why don't they just have one correlation? Life would be easier, I know, but it's not that way. For that long horizontal cylinder, yes, you can use that correlation, or you could use this approach where you would get the C's and the M's out of a table where you have it per range. This is a lot like force flow over a cylinder, isn't it? Sure. Oh, if you really want, you can go in here as a function of angle going around from zero, that would be at the bottom, all the way to pi, that would be at the top. People have studied and looked at the variation of the Nusselt number. This is a little beyond the scope of the text that I want to go to, or this class. We, all, we want to cover enclosures. A lot of times we'll have a gas, like an air or fluid that's enclosed. And in the enclosure, you'll have something hot on one side and cool on the other. And this enclosure, then the hot air rises and the cold air sinks. There'll be some flow like that. In enclosures, Let's say there's a, a top to it that's insulated and a bottom that's insulated. So it's a nice enclosure. Often they don't have two H's, like getting from this hot surface into the fluid and then it vecting over and then getting out of the fluid and kind of resistance there and a resistance there. They don't do that. What they just have is a single H. So they'll have the heat flux is equal to H, temperature hot minus temperature cold from one solid surface all the way to the other solid surface. All right. The other time, thing for enclosures, often they'll say, you know what, we could analyze this as if the fluid is stationary, and then we would just use the thermal conductivity of the stationary fluid. Or we can use the same equation, and we'll use it an effective thermal conductivity, which is often a multiple of the thermal conductivity of the gas or the fluid. It makes sense when you think about it. It's like, oh, it's like conduction, but I'm going to have some enhancement. This, this would be greater than one. I mean, how would it be worse? <laughs> Motion's only going to help move the heat. So let's talk about a rectangular cavity, and this application would be directed toward a window and you have a two-pane window. What do you mean by two-pane window? You have a glass pane, and then you have another pane, and they're sealed around the edges, and then what's in the middle, in between the two window panes? Air, or if you buy a brand new window, it's backfilled with argon, some, some gas like argon. After a number of years, I don't suspect the argon's still in the window. It'll have leaked out, and air will have leaked in. But you go look at Home Depot Lowe's. Just go down the aisle for new windows. They're all double pane. We don't sell triple pane around here. Up north, they have triple pane. Minnesota, you said? Yeah, they're going to have triple pane. <laughs> yeah. Or Alaska, they're going to have triple pane windows. But uh, the most we have is two. So we can analyze, basically, what's happening in that rectangular cavity, which is a trip 
in the in the windows. And so here is a height h and the width. So this is the area. The area is w times h, and l is that gap thickness between the two panes. So on this side, it's all one temperature. On this side, there's all one temperature. And then the other four edges are just insulated. Okay. Well, they say if you want to analyze this, what we have to do is you got to make sure, if you want to use this correlation, that you are in this range of geometric ratios. The Prandtl number is in this range, and the Rayleigh number is in this range. Or it looks like this is a lowercase range of Rayleigh number. This is a higher range of Rayleigh number. Take a look at the exponent here on that Rayleigh number. That looks like LAM to me. And this one looks like TURB to me. So some, you see patterns in these correlations. They're not always just completely random. So what we have to do is we'd have to come in, check this is OK, this is OK. What is my Rayleigh number for this problem based on the length? Well, that is my length. It's the gap thickness. You have to be particular attention. Somebody may say, well, why don't we pick the height for the, the characteristic length? No, if you want to use somebody else's correlation, make sure we, are, we know what they define the Rayleigh number in terms of. So G beta delta T L cubed divided by nu alpha, you would calculate that. If it's in this range, use this correlation. If it's in that range, what would you do with this correlation? Well, the Nusselt number, define where the length scale is L, the gap thickness, is H L divided by K. So I can get H. H is the Nusselt K divided by L. Once I have H, I can use it to get Q. Here would be the H times the area W times H times the delta T. Wouldn't that be the total heat transfer through the window? Yeah. We're going to use that on this next slide when we solve this problem, okay? So you have a vertical double pane window having the height of 0.6 and the width of 0.6. Has a gap, so that's our L is 20 millimeters, 0 0.020 meter. It's filled with air. You could fill it with argon and then do all the calculations, but it's filled with air. And it separates room air. So here's a pane, here's a pane. Here is temperature of the room air inside, which is 25 degrees C. And the temperature of the outside, which is negative 10 degrees C. It's a cold winter day. And so you're going to have a convection to the temperature of the pane 1. Then you're going to have some free convection in that gap, that enclosure, and then that'll have temperature pane two, and then you'll have convection to the outside. So the interior convection coefficient, this H on the inside, is 8.3 watts per meter squared degree C. If you're interested in doing energy analysis of homes or other things, very common consistent value out there used in literature. It's for basically still air inside of a house. 8.3. Historically, why do they have 8.3? Well, it was first in BTUs per hour foot squared degree F, and now they had to convert over and they want to be consistent. Otherwise, they would have probably rounded it off to 9. But anyway. And then for the outside, exterior, 34 watts per meter squared degree C. That's the H on the outside. Again, that is a traditional uh, energy analysis. You're going to assume 15 mile per hour wind. It's high wind blows more in the winter. And so that's a standard value used. All right. So neglect thermal radiation. Make the problem easy. And then Neglect thermal resistance within each window pane. So I know the glass has this side and that side, but just say they're one temperature. Neglect the conduction resistance through each little window pane itself. Makes life easy. Estimate the heat loss from the room to the outside. I want to calculate that Q. That the heat loss is going to be the outside, uh, inside minus the outside temperature divided by a sum of thermal resistances. So what do you mean by the sum of thermal resistance? We'll have this 1 over H on the inside area, 1 over the H in the outside area, 
And how do we handle that enclosure? One over an effective H area where that effective H is based on arc enclosure with the Rayleigh number, et cetera. Okay. So uh, all the work's done here and here. That area is the width uh, times the height. The, the height and the width are given. So I have to calculate this H right here. How do I calculate that H? On the, let's call it the H in the gap. That's going to be the Neusselt number as a function of the thickness of the gap or the width of the gap times the thermal conductivity of the fluid in the gap, air, divided by the gap thickness. How do we get that Neusselt number? You look for the right correlation, which is a function of the Rayleigh number and the Prandtl number. And the Rayleigh number, based on the gap thickness, um, um, G beta delta T L cubed divided by nu alpha. So I want you to, to solve more problems. Have I not been encouraging you enough to solve the homework problems? Should I every day say solve homework problems? Read the book, etc. Some of you, I'm going to hand back the exam, need to be congratulated. You did very well. Some of you need to be encouraged to move on. Let's not save studying for this class till two days before the exam. You just dig yourself a hole. All right? So please study every day. Yes, sir. This delta T right here, very good question, is the temperature pane with its hotter minus the temperature pane inner. I don't know those. I'm trying to calculate them. That's actually the, the question for part B. But guess what you have to do? Iterate. You just have to assume to get the temperature proper. You have to also, these nu and alpha, they're a function of some film temperature. That's going to be pane 1 plus temperature pane 2 divided by... Two. This is a bad looking two, isn't it? And so you're kind of stuck. I need to know the answer before I can calculate the answer. Iterate. Assume and move forward. So if we assume that the film temperature, so I can look up fluid properties, is around uh, 275 Kelvin. I don't have too much interpolation to do. I just have to add two numbers, divide by two in my table for air properties. Then I can go and uh, I'll assume that this is 25 minus 10, that would be uh, 35 degree max. Uh, I assume that, that it would be 10 Kelvin difference in the gap as a starting point. But I would have to iterate. And what happens is I calculated a Rayleigh number, and the Rayleigh number comes in 1.08 times 10 to the 4. We go look at the correlation. We have this rectangular cavity. It's really close to the lower limit. It's just inside. So let's use this correlation. We can use this correlation with the Prandtl number. I'm not listing all the properties, but you would get that the Neusselt number comes in at 1.54. Once I have that Neusselt number, I can get the H, the convection coefficient, right there. That convection coefficient comes in at around 77 watts per meter squared degree C. I then can get the sum of the R's and then calculate the Q. And then the Q comes in at about 18 watts. Did I iterate? No. Could I iterate? Yeah. Will it change the answer? Yes, some, but not a lot. It'll refine it. Then I go back and how do I calculate the temperature of the pain one? Well, we just did what the Q is through the whole system, isn't it? So using the answer for part A, the temperature in the pane 1 is the temperature on the inside minus the Q times that resistance on the inside. The resistance on the inside is 1 over H inside area. And so this comes in the temperature pane 1 comes in around 19 degrees C. 
And likewise, same equation, you calculate temperature pane 2 is about negative uh, 9 degrees C. So the delta T in the gap is more like 20-something, 20 28. So I should come back and I should uh, revise this, which would update my Rayleigh number, uh, maybe update my film temperature to get properties, and redo it. Okay. Any other comments or questions? I'm rushing a little bit. Let me kind of press forward. So with the enclosure, you can uh, sometimes look for correlations, and they'll, they'll actually give you a K-effective correlation instead of a Nusselt number. But it's very, very similar. Let me use this one. So here is a cylinder inside of a cylinder, hot inside of a cold, and they give you the radius. You can cal calculate this, this characteristic length, L sub C, and then use that L sub C to calculate the Rayleigh number. I wish they would have put R-A-L-C, but they just put R-A-C. That sounds like the critical Rayleigh number, isn't it? But it's the Rayleigh number based on the, this characteristic length. Anyway, uh, that should be R-A-L-C. You can stick that in there, and then you get a factor. This would all be a factor, such that K effective is some factor times the thermal conductivity of the stationary fluid. Well, this equation you should recognize. If this would have been a stationary insulation, you would just replace this by the K of the insulation. Just straight conduction. All right. Here's a problem. Um, in the interest of time, let me just do this. Let me say that um, you, you find that the K effective is equal to 5.014 times K for this problem. So it like magnifies it by 5. And then you can go and solve for Q over L is about 70 watts per meter. If we go back to this other problem and you say, is there also a K effective in this problem? There sure is. Let's go ahead and find it. So um, you have, it takes a little bit, let me do this. You had this resistance from the temperature pane 1 to temperature pane 2, and it was 1 over HA. Somebody says, but what happens if it would have been a stationary fluid? Well, it would have had, um, the resistance wouldn't have been 1 over HA. It would have been the gap thickness, L, divided by KA. Well, so I'd like to use that equation, but instead of using the conductivity of the gas, I need to use the effective conductivity. So the equation for the effective conductivity, K effective, is just L times H. See that? Okay. Well, how did we get H? Uh, wasn't that Nusselt times K divided by L? Sure. So you put L times H was the Nusselt. K divided by L. What cancels? Somebody could have just as easily given the correlation to be the Nusselt times K. So that Nusselt number. Hey, well, for our problem, what was our Nusselt number? 1.54. Eh, it had a 50% increase. And when you design these windows, basically you want a thin gap, but if it's so thin, you know, what's the purpose? Is just make one thick single pane window instead of two thin double pane when you know, the glass made out of two panes. So you want it uh, far enough, but not too far that you get a lot of buoyancy driven flow between the two panes. So this looks like it was a pretty well designed window. All right. Well, with that, I want to say that the combined for and forced and free convection skip. Uh, concentric spheres is, you know, there's not much there. But cylinders, cavities, we emphasize because they're so practical. Uh, you get free convection parallel plates and channels. Eh, you know, if you have that geometry, you look it up. Uh, free convection from vertical plate, very important. 
inclined horizontal, you just modify the G. We modified the G. A long horizontal cylinder, yes, spheres, etc. Also, if somebody gives you a problem and, and it's a long, fairly large diameter uh, vertical cylinder, theoretically, cut it and unwrap it and it becomes a plate. Think about that for a minute. Just sort of cut it, unwrap it, and it's a plate. So you'll see plate uh, correlations used with long uh, vertical uh, cylinders. Turbulence, there is a critical Rayleigh number. And when it's laminar, you can get a similarity solution and solve for the boundary conditions and the boundary layer equations. But this is all very mathematically challenging. Don't forget, what is beta? Is it always 1 over t? No. With that, I'm going to stop and pass back your exams.